Diaz. I, uh, that would make sense. Last time she put that, but she put Diaz this time. <laughs> Okay. Well, welcome, welcome back. Um, before before we get into today's lecture, I'm going to be um, I'm going to be a, a I'm going to add, I'm going to give a little a small advertisement that that maybe maybe some people would be interested in, uh, maybe not, and you wouldn't normally you wouldn't normally uh, find out about this or, or know about this, but I, I wanted to kind of um, at least mention it to you. I, I I think you all know that I have something of a double life, right? So I'm I'm an, I'm an electrical engineering professor and and uh, and all. But in in in, the, in my background, I also have an entrepreneurial um, and a, and, a, and, a, and a commercial side as well. I, I I started I guess when I got an MBA, although before that I was actually spinning companies, trying to spin companies out of my lab as well. Um, and then I took some time off in industry, and I I was a, a product manager in, a, in the telecom world. Uh, for a couple of years, um, and that the, and the, being a product manager is just absolutely an incredibly fun and difficult uh, job. That's just constant level of decision making, you know, and, and 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 going back and forth between the equations of the antennas or the equations of whatever you're doing and the dollar signs and 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 and, and the poker games of the marketplace. And so, what, one of the things that we I did a few years ago. As I put together a course that's sort of, I would argue that it's fairly unique around around the world, um, and that is uh, the, te the 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 management of high technology products. So it's high technology product management. There's plenty of product management courses out there in business schools uh, for people to go to Procter and Gamble and 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 become the product manager of a brand of shampoo, or or or, or, or yogurt or what have you. And that's that's very very fun job. Don't get me wrong. It's a very very challenging, very very nice career path. But there are fewer for the high technology product management, um, and probably probably fewer. By I mean, there's very very hard to find even say at an MIT or a business school or a or a or a, or a Harvard business school. But we but I put one together, and it's and, it, and it's it's kind of it's it's I'm pretty happy with it after the first time through it was horrible. Um, the second time through was better, and now I'm actually kind of I've done it three times. And I'm actually kind of happy with the course. Um, it benefits from having more people in the room, and so I, I'll be teaching it. I, I teach it every couple of years, and this spring I will actually teach it. Um, it'll be Saturday afternoons in an executive style course. So if you're working in, in a company, it's particularly easy to take. I have no idea what pricing is, um, although I imagine there's a little bit of a premium for it because of the it's over in the business school, and then and they like to charge premiums there. So, so um, but 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 look for it. Um, if you have any, if you want to find out more about it, you can talk to me or you can talk to um, uh, Rajiv Shah over in the business school who runs the systems engineering and management uh, program. Um, and it's an, and so it's a. If you don't catch it this time, you know, think about it. I'll, I'll, I'll offer it again every every year and a half, every two years, depending on on demand. Um, it's kind of a hobby for me. It's a fun course. It's based on um, primarily on cases. So so you read you read you read these cases, and then you have to make a decision. You know, do you start the company? What how do you price that at? This what do you, where do you put the pricing at? What do you what do you do next? You know. So those are those are those are the those are the questions. And again, it's um, uh, there's no right answers, unlike engineering. There's, there's it's all vague. And if you if you price your product and you sell a lot of it, you make a lot of money. You probably left money on the table because you didn't price it high enough. <laughs> if you have a really really popular product and you and you um, um, and you and you don't make enough of them, you leave money on the table. If you if you make a lot of your product and nobody buys it, you're stuck with a lot of inventory that you can't sell. So, so it's nerve, it can be either nerve-wracking or really, really fun. So I bring that up just uh, as an advertisement um, and an opportunity that you don't, wouldn't normally be able to access. So if you think about a career path beyond or in concert with the engineering, um, that's, a, that's an interesting one. Okay? All right. Um, let's go back to the analysis. We almost... Frustrating. If I didn't blab on so long, we would have gotten through the far, the, the far field approximation from soup to nuts, and so and so. There's just a handful of little things to tie up, and so now you're going to have to sit through a, a review of the whole um, a, a derivation again, which I don't think is bad. But here's our far field approximation, and we start with the convolution integral that relates j to a. Okay, and so this piece inside the convolution integral is the Green's function. 
the response of the system, the Lambert's equation, to the delta function. So it's a delta function response. This is the, the unique forcing term for the particular antenna. And so we write the response A as the convolution of the delta function with the, with the antenna. Okay? And we, we, we saw last time that we could get a very general kind of result uh, that separated out the R dependence from the theta and the phi dependence by, by making an approximation that we were very far away from the antenna or reasonably far away from the antenna. Uh, tonight we'll start the, a specific antenna and we'll start to see the difference. We'll start to see exactly where that far field happens. Okay? But, but in, this case, in this case we just know that it's far. Um, I have a certain origin. I have a certain observation point. My antenna is sitting at the end of this vector R prime. Okay? In fact, I should probably add that to the to the um, to the uh, to the uh, picture, so I, I, I have an R prime to the antenna. Um, I have the physical R that takes me from the origin to the observation point, and the physical propagation, the role of this capital R here, connects the antenna to the observation point P. So with that in mind, go back into this convolution integral and take a look, and you see the capital R of the Green's function. You see the R prime which allows you to comprehend the entire antenna current distribution. And then you have R, which tells you what, what, a of R, what, the, what the A is at a particular point in space. So R, R prime, and capital R are inherent in that, in that, um, that convolution integral. Okay? Now, in the far field approximation, what we're going to say is we're going to take the projection of R prime onto R, and see this, this little piece, R prime, uh, dotted with R, the unit vector, um, the, we're going to say that this guy here and this piece here is approximately the same. Okay? That's not to say that this is small and negligible. It's just always. It's just that, this, this, that, that, that um, I can write capital R as approximately R minus R prime dotted with R. So I'm saying that this capital R is approximately equal to R minus this particular little bit here. So I have an R in it, and I have the R prime in it, but the R prime comes in in a very specific way. Now, I substitute this capital R into here and into here. And the, the mathematical behavior is so very different um, from a linear combination to an exponential, to what happens in the exponential. So in this linear denominator, this guy can just be small relative to that, and I'm left with a 10% or a 1% or a, or a, or a you know, one one thousandths of, a, of, a, of an error in my distance. And who really cares about that, a small, small change in my distance? Because there's going to be more or less absorption on, a, you know, on different weather days and so on and so forth. So that's not really a big deal there. Mathematically, it's really nice because all of a sudden I can take that 1 over r and pull it outside the integral. Okay? So see this one over R here. Uh, take a look at down below here and uh, here. The denominator is so much nicer. And if you think in terms of doing this integral, you've saved yourself a lot of headache by, that, by the mathematical form of that. That one over, that one over thing. Do you remember having to do those, tra those darn trig substitutions? Well, that's where you were headed, you know, down that, that horribly tedious path if you didn't do something slick and easy and cheap like that, you know, to get, get rid of that. The, 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 the numerator is very, very different, however. You've got the distance term, which is an R. You're integrating with respect to the prime coordinate system, so that guy goes through the integration. And then you've got this guy here, which is the relative phase shift, the relative shift of, whether you're, of what part of the antenna you're on whether you're at the extreme of the dish or in the bowl of the dish or somewhere halfway up, tells you this is given by this. And you can imagine that the shaping of that dish is really critical, and so the shaping of that dish is, is exactly this particular guy here. It's not exactly true, but to be sloppy and to make a point, you've got phase effects that give rise to your antenna patterns, and you've got amplitude effects that give rise to your antenna patterns. Okay? Now, the amplitude, this, this J is also phase. So there's phase and amplitude here, and then there's phase here as well. Okay? 
So that's why I'm, that's why it's a, that that was a little bit of a of a of a oversimplification. But basically, adjusting phase and adjusting amplitudes are the way you focus or direct the radiation off of your antenna. Okay, so you you. You bend you you bend your coat your wire coat hanger in just a certain way. What you're doing is you're affecting more or less the face, right? As you as you bend that out, you're affecting the face distribution on that on that on your antenna, and and therefore drastically changing your your um, reception. Okay, so that's physically what's going on with that. Well, when you do that. Um, and, and you do that, you're left with a, a, a separation. Here's all the R, and here's all the, th the, the theta and phi. So this is just how far away from the antenna you are. Are you 10 meters? Are you 100 meters? Are you 1,000 meters? Dot, 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 dot. This is what direction you're looking at the antenna from. Are you looking into the bowl? Are you looking a little bit away from the bowl? Are you looking completely behind the bowl and not seeing any signal at all? Okay. So this so this this is um, this guy here is f of theta and phi. Now mathematically, um, now mathematically you have then uh, an a that you're able to, to to write as the r dependence, and then an f of r, an f sub theta, an f sub theta, an f sub phi. All of these guys are only functions of theta and phi. And it's this form here, the definite dependence in r and the arbitrary dependence in theta and phi, that allow you to write solutions. To the to the to the radiation problem, that that says okay, this is just a distance away from the antenna, but this is the shape of the antenna, and so at the end of the day, this is what you're ending up designing. You're designing f of theta and phi, and when you buy an antenna, what you'll find is you'll open a catalog, and what they'll give you is they'll give you plots, polar plots, effectively of of the f of theta and phi. Okay. So you'll pick one antenna from another antenna out of a catalog based on effectively, not quite, but effectively this term here. Okay? So that's, that's the physical meaning. Now, what we spent most of our time doing last time, and I won't go through each and every step, I'll give you the high-level picture, is we took the curl of this, we took the curl of, the, the curl of this, and we walked down and we got a, a, an H field and we got an E field. So I droned on and on and on taking the curls in the r direction, the curl of a in the theta direction, the curl of a in the phi direction. And so I got one, two, three, four, five, six terms, I think. Four of those terms, one is one over r squared. Two of those terms, one is one over r. The one over r wins in the far field. Far, far away from the antenna, one over r is much stronger than one over r squared. We ignore the one over r squared terms, and we write a very a rather simple expression for h, which is a function of r, theta, and phi, as this equation here. And that's that, I think that equation is one of it's a very very nice and very very cute equation for for h in terms of one over r dependence, the one over r dependence. Here's the oscillatory term, the the ikr is here. And then, and then this is the shape. This is how the shape function manifests itself to produce the H field. Okay. Notice that what we found is that the H, the strongest components of H, point in the theta direction and the phi direction, perpendicular to the movement away from the antenna. So H is perpendicular to the movement of R away from the antenna. Okay. Now um, we we then took the curl of that H to get E, and one of the things that I did to save time, to save paper, is I just picked the two um, strongest terms. And I want you to do a little bit of thought, a little bit of worrying, a little bit of paranoia. Did I leave something out by not taking the curl of those other four terms? Okay, I didn't, and you can think, you can think through that, but I don't, want, I don't want you to trust me. I want you to worry about it yourself, and I want you to, to convince yourself that, that I wasn't just lying to you, right? People do. I don't, but I don't try to. I'm not, in, and I'm, more to the point, I'm not in this particular case. But I want you to be, I want you to be comfortable with it in your own right, okay? Um, all right, so you, 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 you find the R component of E, you find the theta component of E, you find the phi, the phi component of E. A lot of really fun mathematics that we had, we had a good time with. And we again saw that two of the terms, when is one over R, 
and four and four or five of the terms, I can't remember exactly, uh, when is one over r squared. And so we keep the one over r term as the strongest one, and so we have the electric field, uh, we have the, 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 the r dependence, one over r dependence, the oscillatory term in r, and we have, again, uh, theta, a theta component and a phi component. A theta component and a phi component. Okay? And let's see. And that's as far as we got. Okay. So now we have to play around with those two, those two expressions. Okay? Um, the first thing I will do is I'll take the dot product of this and the, of this term here. Forget, we'll forget about the, the, the terms in front. But I'll take the dot product of the vector part of H and the dot product of the vector part of E. Okay? So E dotted with H will equal a bunch of stuff times F sub phi uh, dotted with F sub, with this term here, F sub theta, okay? And then this, the phi terms dotted together, which gives me a minus F sub theta multiplied by an F sub phi. I flipped through a lot of pages. Are you okay with that? Okay, so I took this term here, dotted with this term here, and I got f phi f theta. I took this term here, dotted with this term here, and I think I got my minus sign right, minus f theta f phi. And so this dot product equals zero. And what does that tell us? Pardon? They equal each other? They're perpendicular to each other. So E is perpendicular to H. Okay? Okay. So, so in the far field, the electric field, the, the radiation field, the electric field that propagates that wins in the far field is perpendicular to the, to the magnetic field that wins in the far field. Okay? So E is perpendicular to H. And by the way, they point in the angular dependence, the angular di direction, and that's perpendicular from the R away from the antenna. All right. The next thing I'll do is E crossed with H. And why am I doing that? That's S. That's the pointing vector. And so that's going to equal I gamma cubed E to the minus twice gamma R. We're talking about power over 4 pi squared omega epsilon and then I have um, an r squared in the denominator. So power flow will fall off as 1 over r squared. Okay? And then I have an f theta a sub, whoops, a sub theta plus f phi a sub phi crossed with f phi a sub theta minus f theta a sub phi. And we can construct the matrix. In fact, let's go ahead and just quickly do that. a sub r, 0, 0, a sub uh, theta, f theta, f phi, a sub phi, uh, f phi minus f sub theta, um, a sub r, 0, 0, and a sub theta, uh, f sub theta, f sub phi. And so I'll have, a, um, I'll have a component in the r direction here. I'll have a component in the r direction from this guy here. And I think everything else is zeros, right? Yeah, everything else is zeros. And so what I'll have is this equal to I gamma cubed e to the minus 2 gamma r over 4 pi quantity squared omega 
epsilon r squared, and this will be, there'll be a minus sign, and it's f sub theta squared plus f sub phi squared, and this will point in the r direction. And that's my s. Remember, there's a time variation in this as well. There's a time variation with this where it's a very simple time variation. It's just an e to the i omega t. And so if I want to time average this, I'll just do the complex conjugates and get rid of it. So this is also effectively the time averaged um, s as well. Okay? So why did you add the minus? Oh, um, it turns out from, the, from this guy here oh, to here. Okay. I wouldn't worry too much about it because it's got that I in there as well. Okay. And so you're going you're gonna to square and square root it to get the amplitude. Okay. So it's really just a manifestation of the phase of the, of the S vector. Okay. All right. So, so this piece here, this piece here is how the energy or how the power falls off. And again, power falls off as 1 over r squared, 1 over r from the E field, 1 over r from the H, H field. The overall power goes as 1 over r squared. That's where that comes from. This is also known as the inverse square law. Okay? And this is the part where I really talk about peanut butter on basketballs, right? So you have a very small tennis ball and you coat it with a fairly thick la layer of peanut butter. As you grow r, r squared, the surface area goes down as r squared. You have the same amount of peanut butter, same amount of power, and now you're smearing it across a wider and wider area. Okay? And then, and then, and then as you get bigger and bigger and bigger, the, the peanut butter gets thinner and thinner and thinner. The power distribution goes, goes thinner and thinner and thinner. And that's exactly what this R, one of our R squared law is. Okay? We are located, the Earth appears to be located just at the magic distance from the sun so that we have just the right amount of temperature that, that provides a certain amount of chemical reactions to support the making of wheat and malt and hops and therefore beer. Okay? So um, that's, that's my interpretation of that one of our R squared term. For what it's worth, this guy here is the shape factor. Right? This is this is what happened to my f of my of my the, the function of, of theta and phi is sitting right in here, and so this is what people sometimes refer to as the gain. They might plot it on log scales and talk in terms of gain of an antenna of dB, but that's basically where where the where the focusing part, where the direction, the directivities, or the focusing comes from from this particular pattern. Okay, so that, that when, you, when you open up your catalog and you look at the, those polar plots from different antennas, more or less that's what they're going to be plotting there, is that f sub theta squared plus f sub phi squared. And so now you can kind of see this, you've, you've isolated out this whole business of shaping your antenna and what it means with respect to the, to the link budget at least, or the power. Um, oh, there's one more thing we can do with this. There's one more thing we can do with this. Um, the uh, E and H together can also be expressed as E, and I'm just going to do the magnitude over H.
So, so, um, oh, the magnitude, uh, I'm going to get rid of that I as well. Um, so if this is the this is the magnitude of the electric field over the magnitude of the, of the of the magnetic field, you see that almost everything cancels out. Remember that gamma is like two pi over lambda, and C is equal to 1 over the square root of mu epsilon. So you put all that together, and this is equal to the square root of mu over epsilon, or 377 ohms. It's just like a plane wave. Okay. So the impedance of free space far away from the antenna comes out when I take the ratio of even those very complicated dependencies of E and H. So that's kind of startling. That's kind of comforting, reassuring. Um, and I think it sort of points out where plane waves come from. In other words, if I have some sort of antenna source, then the phase fronts that come off that antenna are going to smooth out. Notice at this point, it's kind of a nice circular, one over our spherical wavefront, a spherical curved wavefront. And if I continue to go on, eventually I can have a fairly flat wave if I restrict my viewing angle to some number of steradians. Okay. So in general, I'm going, to, I'm going to start with an arbitrary shape, very complicated phase fronts. The del squared operator, the averaging of the del squared operator of the, the Lambert's wave equation is going to smooth out the wrinkles. The spherical geometry is going to take over and give me predominantly a spherical phase front. And then, and that spherical phase front, the, the, um, the k vector will be normal to that. Very complicated K behavior here, but here rather smooth and nice. And, uh, you know, um, and, then, and then eventually, as an approximation, the radius of curvature gets so large that we're left with a, a, a plane wave. Okay? So that's where plane waves come from. So now, let's do another example. And again, I think we'll go the other extreme. We'll do a very complete E and H. We'll do a very, very complete E and H. You will be bored <laughs> until every once in a while a really wonderful result will pop out. So stick with it. Uh, but we'll do it for the simplest, absolutely simplest, most trivial antenna that we can think of, which is an antenna that doesn't have any length at all. Okay? Or it has a length that's very, 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 very small. Okay? Um, so let me draw. Now, if this antenna is only the size of a point... If the antenna is only the size of a point, then to your question earlier, I'll put it right at the origin of the, of the coordinate system. And that will greatly simplify my, my um, that will greatly simplify my, my, um, my problem. So I'll put my dipole or, origin, I'll put my dipole moment right at the origin there, and I will line it up with the z-axis, which means my 
J will point in my z-axis, which means my A will point in my z-axis. Okay? So I'm going to have a little bit of vector manipulation to do on that. So this, this, this guy here I'll write as I times the length dl, and I'll drive it with as a cosine of omega t. Okay? Now, notice that I'm, I'm not writing, driving it as e to the i omega t. I'm driving it as cosine omega t, because I have, so I have control over the phase. I'm picking the phase. What that means is when we look at A, E, and H, they're going to have a term that's going to be at, at cosine and a term that's going to be at sine. So we'll be able to tell how out of phase the A is from J, the, J is from, the H is from J, and the E is from H. So by being a little bit specific about this, It'll, be, it'll make it more, that minus i that someone was asking about in the last equation, we'll, that, the i won't be in here because we'll be having, it. we'll have definite sinusoids. Okay? So I think, so I think that'll be a little clearer for, for us. Okay? Now, we have on top of this the vector capital R, which takes us out to some arbitrary observation point. If I drop my axis down from, from this, and I measure relative, this shadow, relative from x, that's my phi. The angle down from the z-axis is my theta. So I'll have components that stick out this way I'll just label a couple just to just to um, just to give you a flavor. So I'll have electric fields, for example, that may point out in the r direction. I may have electric fields that point out down in the theta direction. And then I may have a field. I'll use h for this one that points off in the phi direction. Okay at that particular point, R. Now, when I say that my DL, the length of this antenna, is infinitesimal, that means that's small, but it's small relative to what? Observation. Relative to? Observation. The observation point? No, because we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, we're gonna be, we're going to solve this problem completely. We're going to solve for the fields very close in and show that it reduces to our far field approximation that we had before. So I want to do, in fact, the very complete work for, the, for this. Wavelength. The wavelength is always the ruler of our electric fields, right? It's always the physical length measure meter stick of it. So, so how big is this relative to... Uh, the, the, the wavelength. So, for example, if I'm at a gigahertz, my wavelength is a foot. If my antenna is, I don't know, a millimeter, maybe up to a centimeter, that's pretty small relative to the wavelength. That's, that's, that, would, that would be what would happen if you had your little Wi-Fi antenna and it broke off and you stuck a little paper clip there. You'd, you'd be replacing your, your carefully designed antenna with a little, small little stub of wire, and that would be a reasonable dipole approximation. Okay? Another way to think about this is, um, does anyone remember how, what the bond length is for a carbon-to-carbon -carbon bond? Is it about a, a half angstrom? Or about 
um, 0.05 nanometers, something like that. And so a molecule, even a fairly large molecule, will have a, um, you know, 20, 50 of these carbon bonds in them. And so, and so you'll get up to a nanometer for a molecule of length. And your, your wavelength of light, green light, might be 500 nanometers. So the interaction of light with matter, individual molecules, will, will also be characterized by a dipole radiation. Okay? So it's, it's interesting. This, is a, this, is, this seems like a speck of an antenna, and it seems like it won't have much engineering application, but in fact it goes on to describe a large, large, large number of interactions wherever I have a, a, a large wavelength relative to a small piece of metal. Okay? In fact, you know, if I'm down at 60 hertz, I've got, the, I've got a huge wavelength, and you, know, you can calculate that a city block of metal is tiny relative to that. Right? So that's your scaling factor, and, and so, you, so put it that way, put it that way, there's a large number of physical situations where this is very, very useful. Okay? Now the other, the other thing is I'm only doing one, um, I'm only doing one, uh, orientation, and I should probably put one along the x-axis and one along the y-axis as well. And then I have to worry about the phases across all three of them, right? So even with dipoles, I, can, I get to have fun. Oh, I could also, I could also do, put a whole bunch of dipoles all, all along this x-axis, all pointing in the z, z direction. Or I can, have just a, uh, I can just buy a salt shaker of dipoles and throw them out and scatter them out in space, and, and, and then I'll have a, a contribution for a large number of of these dipole antennas. Okay, maybe maybe those are glucose molecules sitting in a in water, a glucose, a sugar water solution. Okay, so just so the, the, just to give you some physical pictures for what what kinds of physical systems we're modeling uh, with this with this mathematics, it's going to get fairly involved. Okay. All right. So our first step is to calculate a of r. And I'll write down my convolution integral. And notice that I'm writing down, um, I'm writing down the uh, retarded potential. So I'm going to make use of that form. I still have the 1 over R. The reason I want to do that is because I'm, I have a trigonometric 4A series and not a, not a, a complex exponential 4A series. So I, I, want to, I kind of want to avoid these I's and J's that float around in the, my problem. So I'm going to go back to the retarded potential perspective. And I'll write down what J is more carefully. And it's I dl, that's my strength. The frequency that I'm operating is omega t. I have to locate this, which I will do with a delta function at the origin. Uh, this delta function at, at a particular r r is a vector, so I'll go ahead and write that as del x, del of y, del of z. And that gives you sort of a hint on how you might treat delta functions in, in space. So a is a function of r, will equal a z as a function of r. pointing in the z direction. And the delta function makes this integration very, very easy.
And so that gives us our, our first, almost our first step of the problem. Okay. Yeah. So that's after you take the native over it. Yep. I use the sifting property. No, the um, I'm integrating with respect to space, and so and so and this this R over V looks like it has an R in it, but it's really just a time shift, right? So I'm not, so I, I'm, I'm so and, and in fact that's an interesting point, right? Okay, let, let, let me let me actually I, let me give your let me give your your question a better answer than just no. Um, the cosine term here goes up and down, up and down, up and down. So the A field here will go up and down, up and down, up and down. We, we're very confident then of the Z and the Z. Okay? But this retarded potential means that the cosine here, as the cosine starts to go up a cycle, the, whether we're close in or far away or, or, or overly far away, we may or may not be in phase. Okay? So if I look at this from a trig perspective, this is a cosine of, of, of omega t plus a theta. So there will be both a cosine term and a sine term, and, the, and how far in phase or out of phase that is depends on this, this phase angle, which is r over v. Okay? So you don't get the trivial sign from the, diff, from the integration, but you do get a phase shift that's dependent on the distance away that takes you from all cosine to cosine plus sine to all sine to sine plus cosine all the way back to cosine. Okay? Is that a better answer? Yes. Sorry. That's a good question. I, 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 I answered it too quickly. Okay? All right. Um, now, all of this, the system, the system is at this point a spherical coordinate system, right? It's spherically symmetric. And lining up my line right along the z-axis was really nice. It got me an A, but now an A as in the vector potential, not an A of a grade, but it got me, it got me, it got me the vector potential A, and now I'm going to try to take the curl of it, and I need to take the curl of it in spherical coordinates because this is fundamentally a spherical problem. Right? So what I have to do is I have to do a little bit of vector decomposition. And so I have to write A sub R, A sub theta, and A sub phi. Okay? Now, the, the dipole is lined up in Z, which means A is lined up in Z. Okay? That means there's a projection in the r direction, a projection in the r direction, and a projection in the phi direction, coming down from the z-axis. Okay, the movement away from the x-axis is perpendicular to the z, and so there's no component here. And then the projection in the r direction is the cosine of this angle here and the direction in the theta direction is minus the sine of this angle here. Okay? My drawing's not really good enough but, but you may want to blow up where the theta is and where the, this direction and this direction are. Okay? And so now we can write mu is equal to the curl of A. And mu sub, mu H sub R. Oh, what am I doing? Mu H. Mu H is equal to the curl of A. Okay. 
Take a look at A. Two things are, are about it. two things are important with A. There is no phi dependence. There's no A sub phi. Right? So any curl term that has a D by D R or a D by D theta of A sub phi are going to, is going to go to zero. Okay? Furthermore, furthermore, if I look through here, I have an R dependence and I have a theta dependence. I do not have a phi dependence. Okay? So, in addition, del by del phi will equal zero. It's perfectly symmetrical in the phi axis. Mathematically, what that means is mu h sub r, the curl of A um, in the r direction, will equal zero. And mu h sub theta will equal the curl of A in the theta direction will also equal zero. This term in R is d by d phi. Well, you're not going to get anything from that one. And it's a d by d theta of a sub phi. Well, you're not going to get anything from that one either. This term here has a d by d phi. Well, you're not going to, of a sub r, you're not going to get that. And it has a d by, it has a d by, d by d r of a sub phi. You're not going to get anything there. So these two terms go away, and it turns out that you only get an h sub phi. So you only get the h moving away. So let, let's take a look, at, let's think about this for a second, okay? I was using my blue pen for the dipole, and I'm lining that up right with the z-axis. And as I walk around this, in the phi direction, right, in the xy plane, as I walk around this in the phi direction, I don't see anything, any difference. I can't tell one side of my dipole from the other side of my dipole. There's no mirror behind it. There's no nothing. As I walk around this, it looks the same. That's why there's no phi dependence. That's why it's perfectly symmetric in the phi dependence. Okay? So A, the perpendicular to that, will give me my H. That's the curl, the function of the curl. And that's going to point in this direction here. So h will point h will point in the phi direction. Okay? And it will be a function of r and theta. Okay? So I only have one h magnetic field h. And if you actually start to then then if you kind of think about that for for just a second, you'll say, okay, I'm taking the curl of that to get my e and boy, was he lucky at guessing exactly the three components that we're going to have in the problem. We're going to have an, an h sub theta, and that h sub theta will give rise to an e sub r, and an, I'm sorry, h sub phi, and that h sub phi will give rise to an e sub r and an e sub theta. Okay? Boy, was that prescient in the way I, I drew that drawing. Okay. So... H sub, H sub phi, 1 over mu r times del by del r of r a sub theta minus del a sub r del theta One bracket too far. Okay. 
And now I'll close the big bracket here with that one there. So now when I take the derivative with respect to space, I'll turn some of those cosines into sines because of the, the d by dr of that. Okay? So notice that I have a term that goes as 1 over r. And I also have a term that goes as 1 over r squared. And in the far field approximation, we would know not to use that. But what I'd like in this problem is I'd like to know what the near field and the far field is doing. I'd like to know what's going on near the antenna and also far from the antenna. So I'm going to keep both of these terms. But I'll tell you, I'm really getting tired of writing that t minus r over v. So I'm going to put this t prime in there. And then I'm going to try to remember, and you're, I'm going to try and help you very much remember, to, uh, that, that when, I take, when I take a d by dr, I have, a, I have something for that t prime. That t prime has an r in it. In it. OK? Now, this is a good place to sort of learn something. This is, this is, this is, I told you there would be a lot of tedious mathematics and every once in a while something would pop out that was kind of interesting here. And so I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot, or I'm going to sketch, plotting his way to two curves, a 1 over r and a 1 over r squared. Everyone see that? So if I'm far away from the antenna, I argued that 1 over r wins. And so the blue line is bigger than the red line. But the opposite holds when I get really, really close to the antenna. When I get really close to the antenna, it's the 1 over r squared term that wins over the 1 over r. And those term, those, so those terms, those curves have to cross. at some critical r that sort of is a boundary below which you're 1 over r squared or beyond which you're 1 over r. Does that seem reasonable? So, oh, by the way, we call the 1 over r squared term the induction term. And we call the 1 over r term the radiation term. So the, the radiation term is energy that flows into the far field. The induction term, I have to, like an inducted, like a, like a, like a mutual inductance of a, of, a, of a transformer or inductive coupling, I've got to be really close in. I have to have two inductors really close together to, to talk to each other, and there the dependence is the 1 over r squared. Okay, so you've, you've, you've probably run across that term induction before, right? And the induction field. And that's where they've worked, the, the, the part inductor comes from. Okay? All right, so where do those guys equal? Well, these guys will cancel out. And so it, look, it looks very kind of simple that I have um, an omega over R critical V is equal to 1 over that r critical squared. 
So at R critical, this term here equals this term here. I'm going to find some magic T so that these, the cosines and the sines are the same. Uh, this guy, these guys all cancel out. So this is really all that's left over. And R critical is equal to V over omega, which I think is easier to write as lambda over 2 pi. or lambda over 6 and some change. Okay? So when you're less than lambda over pi, 2 pi, less than lambda over 6, you're in close. You're talking to you're talking to your neighbor through an inductive term. When you go lambda over okay, so at a gigahertz with your if you're within 2 inches of that gigahertz, you're in the near field. You're inductively coupled. If you go beyond two inches, you're radiatively coupled. Okay? But think about, think about that at 60 hertz. The wavelength for 60 hertz is huge, so you're, so you're always, at that very, very low frequencies, you're always inductively coupled. Okay? But I haven't said anything about any particular frequency or anything like that, so it's all... All this analysis holds perfectly fine. Okay? So that's a startling, that's a startling result. That you are, in the, you are in the far field. You, are in the, you begin to radiate in, in the dominant radiated field as close in as a wavelength over 6. A wavelength over 2 pi. And certainly by the time you're a wavelength away, you're way into the far field your way into the radiative field. Okay? So think about that with respect to some of the frequency bands that you guys work with. If you're working in the E band, if you're working at the terahertz range, if you're working in the optical range, if you're working in the 100 megahertz range or the gigahertz range, think about where you are relative to your antenna and that will tell you whether or not you're inductively or radiatively coupling. Okay? When you get such high frequencies on a board, like up to a terahertz, about the only thing it does to it is radiate. It spills all that energy at very, very high frequencies on, a, on an analog chip spills out over the transistor, and you no longer have discrete components at all. It's just this blob of electromagnetic waves that happen to find other gain elements and other inductors and resistors, it's a completely different problem than when you're down at, say, 100, ma uh, you know, 100 mag, uh, well, 100 G or 50 G. Okay? Very interesting regime. All right. That's one of, that's, that should be one of those results that you carry around in your head. Okay? So simple, so nice. It's yet another manifestation of the wavelength as a ruler. Okay. Well, what's next is the electric field. So the curl of H is equal to epsilon E dot. And so E is equal to 1 over epsilon. The curl of HDT and the, the, this is a nice way to do this because I'm so definite with my frequency. I'm so def, definite with my time behavior. You can see easily integrating that cosine of omega T prime with respect to T. That's no problem whatsoever. And to your point earlier about cosines becoming sines. When we jump from whatever phase we are for H, we will go, we will move, when we do this integration to get to E, we will move that 90 degrees in phase. 
It's on this step that that cosine of retarded potential becomes a sine of retarded potential. And so what that tells you is there's a phase relationship of 90 degrees between that cosine, between the H field and the E field. Okay? And that's also, that's also something that ripples through most of the, most of this stuff. And, and I think those kinds of things are lost when you, when you, um, when you use complex notation. Because that phase shift is lost in, turn, in a little bit of an eye that sticks out in front. And, you know, you tend to, you tend to ignore little details like that. Whereas this, is, it, it becomes rather obvious. Okay? Well, I know, um, I know it's going to be a cold and maybe even a rainy weekend. And so I know you're looking for something to do that's warm. And so what I'll let you do is do all these curls. And I'll be nice and just give you the answers. Okay? So after some, after some dust clears, I could be really cruel and tell you there's, there's a minus sign mistake in here and force you to, to, to motivate you to find it. But I'm pretty sure that, I, that this is right. And first thing we notice is right away with the theta component, with the theta component, that I have an, a one over um, a one over r term, a one over r squared term, and even a one over r cubed term. And the e sub r. The e sub r term gives me an r squared, one of our r squared term and a one of our r cubed term. And again, think about that. The theta term, we, we saw that the h sub phi goes in this direction. And now we have an e sub theta term. Oh, the h sub phi, the h sub phi term had an, a one over r in it. And so does the e sub theta term. So that plus that will go off into the r direction and that will be the far field. Remember from our far field antenna problem, the one of the, the what we kept the one over r in h, and we kept the one over r in in e, and that became the s, the one over r squared in s, moving radiating out. Well, that's this term here, and this term here. So h sub phi one over r, and e sub theta one over r. Those are my two far field terms. If you were worried that we'd slip in any other one over r terms, well, we don't. One over r squared, one over r squared, and in fact, what we get are higher order terms, one over r cubed and one over r cubed. Okay? And the e sub r component, the one that points into the direction of the radiation, only is, re only is inductive. Okay? So the way I kind of look at that is there's, there's some of the some of the terms that ro rotate around the dipole. And there's only two terms that move away from the dipole antenna. So you have this, di you have this oscillating current, and you have a lot of activity, that, a lot of E and H fields that, that whirl around it. Okay? And then, but then uh, just a little bit of it bleeds off into this, in, from this term, and this term, and that's what gives rise to the, to the radiation or the transfer of power, and that's why we can see it. Okay. And I want to remind you that this T prime is retarded time. 
Okay. Now let's take a quick look and see what that integration in time did. I have a sine of omega t here and I have a sine of omega t here and then I have some cosines as well. All right. So now the next step is S, and that's equal to E crossed with H. I know I'm going to have an S sub R, because that's going to be the E sub theta term crossed with the H sub theta term. So that's going to give me my S sub R. Some of that will be inductive, and some of that will be radiative. I have my e, sub, uh, my e cross H, E sub R, crossed with H sub phi, which will give me my S sub R. No, I'm sorry, it gives me my S sub theta. Yeah, E sub R crossed with H sub phi will give me S sub theta. And so what that is, if you think back to my, my thing, that's a pointing vector that moves from the North Pole through the, through the equator through the south pole all the way back. So it's orbiting, that S sub theta is orbiting, is energy, power flow that orbits around the head of this, of this, um, of this dipole. Okay? So moving from the north pole to the south to the north again. And then there's also inductive field that's in the R direction and in, out in the thing. And there's nothing in the phi direction because of symmetry again. Okay? So this implies an S sub theta and an S sub R. S sub theta term, the orbiting term, minus E R H phi. I squared dl squared sine of twice theta over 16 pi squared epsilon sine squared of omega t prime r to the fourth c I have these uh, sine squareds here, and I have these sine of that, so I can do a little bit of trig simplification. And so my S sub theta term, which just orbits around the poles, the axes, it consists of an R cubed, an R to the fifth, and R to the fourth term. And notice that they're all at twice omega t. Okay. They're all oscillating at twice omega t. S sub R
So if I do the same for S sub R, I get a sine of twice omega t over R to the fifth, a cosine of twice omega t over R to the fourth, a sine of twice omega t over R cubed, I get an omega squared, I get a cosine of twice omega t over R squared, and then I get this one from the trig identity. Cosine squared gives me a one, that one survives. If I now ask the question, what is my time averaged S? That guy averages to zero. 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 That doesn't. That's my radiative term. That's the only term that makes it to the far field. That's the only term that delivers time averaged power to the far field. So if I'm, using, if I'm trying to heat up a cup of coffee from this dipole antenna, that's all I got. If I'm trying to excite current onto a receiving antenna, and that's all, of, and then in far field, that's all that I've got. Okay, that's my only. All the other power that it just moves around the dipole goes nowhere. It's very, very busy. It's like a bunch of all these bees buzzing, buzzing, buzzing around the hive, but there's only a few that drift out, and that's the only one that drifts away. So the time average power is just time averaged in the R direction. And that's omega squared, I squared DL squared, sine squared of theta over 32 pi squared R squared C cubed epsilon. And that's measured in watts per meter squared. Okay, so you know, we could have fun with all the inductive terms, but this is an antenna part of the course, and so this is the only term that, that, that's going to be that we're going to look at, and this is this is one of this is one of our key results for the night. Um, when we come back, we'll pull out some of these issues of with sine squared. We'll pull out the issue of um, uh, you know the there's a c in the denominator, things of that nature. One thing that you might enjoy doing this weekend, um, and you can do this much better than I can, is you can plot the sine squared function as a function of theta. Okay? So, so think about what happens to theta as you move from 0 to pi to 2 pi, right? 